It's so easy every day living in love who on and only BK We got rock and roll We got the blue Two stepping in the hall we don't now Cowboys to the dust in preview mirror you can't see our rhythm and roots. Welcome to another episode of LBK Rhythm and Roots podcast. I'm your host, Jason Robertson. Rhythm and Roots is a podcast based on West Texas music artists and the venues that support them. And today, I'm very excited to be here with Mr. Daryl Holland. Hi, Daryl. Hey. How you doing, sir? Good. Good Thank to see you. Thank you for doing this with us today. Absolutely. Daryl is the proprietor of the Cactus Theater in the Depot District, and he's let us come here today and do this interview with him. Thank you so much, man. Yeah. The place looks beautiful. Thanks. Always glad to talk talk about the place that I love hanging out and uh, promoting and uh, anytime you get to talk about a historic you know Lubbock landmark uh, it's a it's a good day absolutely so I mean obviously if you live in Lubbock or if you have been raised around Lubbock or a transplant you've probably heard of the Cactus Theater the Cactus has musical acts they have comedy acts they do movie screenings now yeah, yeah. Um, doing a local one coming up yeah. about a famous bull rider Lane Frost that's right um, so there's a lot of variety here we're up on the balcony we've got a great view of the stage what a great spot this is man these are prime seats if you get the box seats uh, you get the concessions included you get uh, center view and uh, extra counter space and extra leg room so yeah we're in the uh, we're in the executive suite. That's right. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the history of the Cactus Theater. Okay. Um, you know, kind of the inception of the Cactus Theater mm -hmm. and kind of the just the history of, of how you became Mr. Cactus. Now. Well, just uh, uh, a turn of uh, a twist of fate. <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe it was meant to be. Um, the Cactus opened in 1938 uh, and operated for two decades, exactly 20 years, closed in the fall, I believe, of 1958, opened the spring of 38, closed in the fall of 58. So it closed, uh, bookended, you know, two decades, and it was only a single screen movie house. Uh, I've talked to different people, and uh, I've never been able to find anyone who said they saw anything besides a film here. We have some old-timers that come in here, and they'll harken back and say, oh, yeah, one of my first movies was there, first time I sat, you know, and uh, first kiss, or, you know, first time I saw, you know, James Dean, or whatever it would yeah. be. And um, so that's real neat to get those stories, but it really did not have the stage that it has now. Okay. That was brought in later. So it was single screen. And believe it or not, it had 720 seats back in the day uh, with the same number of restrooms we have today. And I sometimes wish we had three or four times the number of restrooms as the patrons do too. But these historic buildings, there's no way to move the walls so or Just or to add. give reference, how many seats do you have currently? 383 today. So less, a little, a little more... Uh, or not quite half, uh, however you would say that, uh, about half as many seats as it wow. uh, did back in the day. But when you think about it, in the 30s, Dust Bowl era, right? Depression, people were smaller. Uh, the seats were not as wide. They didn't go as deep. You didn't have as much leg room. Uh, they were old wooden seats. Today, they're you know padded and extra wide and cup holders we've added. And and so it's a whole different experience from what it was in the 30s. You know, you had those old wooden seats like you would in a school auditorium or whatever. There was no creature comforts. It was get them in, show the film, get them out, run the next one. And uh, so 
Yeah, um, it's just a, a whole different animal. But it ran for those two decades, then it was shuttered for almost 30 years. And the folks next door at Greer Ironworks bought it, and they used it for a scrap iron warehouse. They just they cut a hole in the side, put a door there, and they'd run in and out, and you know if they needed a piece of iron or whatever to do a wrought iron fence or a gate or whatever they were doing, they'd run in and get their scrap metal out of here and run back out and and do it next door, fabricate it next door. So the cactus was. Uh, basically forgotten after 1958 in terms of, you know, an operational facility. It was just basically four walls and, you know, stripped of everything. No, no camera, uh, no projectors, no seating, nothing. And so then uh, in the early 90s, um, several folks got together, led by Don Caldwell and his wife, Terry. Uh, they wanted a place to showcase local talent and their their teaching programs and things like that and just wanted to have a uh, a showcase you know venue for local talent and so that's how it uh, was rebirthed and so there was about 20 investors as I understand it and they all chipped in and and acquired the building and brought it back um, uh, and you know just uh, just use all these different talents and different uh, means to get it operational again and they concentrated a lot on theatrical plays a lot of folks will reminisce they'll come back and say hey uh, I was here for Heavenly Country or the Holy Rock and Rollers or whatever you know uh, these different plays uh, the Everly Brothers uh, play was debuted here I know and, and things like that so a lot of theatrical and a lot of concerts and, and showcasing of local talent for the next 21 years while the Caldwells uh, operated it. And uh, slowly but surely, those different investors uh, were bought out and different things. So the Caldwells pretty well had all of it at the tail end. There was maybe two or three other investors. Um, and so that's kind of the first two uh, eras, I guess you'd say, of the cactus. And then I came along and... I uh, was simply asking Don uh, one day for some advice because I was trying to restore my granddad's theater in Plainview. Uh, and so that's kind of how I'm connected to this and why would I step in and, and uh, you know, go from my other careers to operating the cactus. But basically it was just kind of a historic journey for me, a nostalgia trip for me to kind of be able to step back and kind of do what my dad and granddad did uh, you know, back in the glory days of Hollywood and uh, when movies were king and going to the movies was the social network of its day. You went to be seen and people dressed up and they went to converse and see what was going on in town. That's kind of where you got your, you know, there are the barbershops where you got your local That's gossip, right. I guess. So anyway, I just kind of wanted to relive that and I just love promoting and uh, kind of wanted to relive that era. So were your dad and granddad in the promoting business, in the movie business? Well, granddad, uh, my dad, of course, grew up in it and it was my granddad's projectionist and, uh, you know, did all kinds of stuff, everything from cleaning the ramps, as they called it, you know, with the slopes and uh, from the drive-ins to the walk-ins. Granddad had uh, three drive-ins and uh, was a partner in, in two other walk-ins and then owned one walk-in outright in Plainview. So back in the day, I mean, Plainview had six or seven theaters going at once oh, wow. and now it has zero but um, so my dad kind of grew up in that and he got to experience that and so as I was a kid uh, I would hear these stories you know and they would talk about the granddad would go to Dallas and book these all these pictures you know he'd go and, and screen all these films for you know a week at a time and he'd buy a whole six months worth of, of films or pictures as they called them uh, in a block format so that they would know what their programming was going to be for six months. You'd go screen it live, you know, and, and they the theaters or the studios had all this product, you know, this is the new stuff. Which ones of these do you want? And, and you know, back then you could do a lot more negotiating. Now <laughs> they make you show this film to get to this film, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot changed, you know, through the years and the generations. But I guess that was my reason for for wanting to just kind of like say relive that uh in my own way um try to recapture that you know chase a ghost i guess so but, tell us how it went from asking don codwell for advice <laughs> to you now owning this it didn't take 
too much time, let's just say it was in the thir first 30 seconds when I sat down and said, Don, hey, uh, you know, I'm trying to do this project in plain view, and I don't think it would be any uh, competition per se to what you're doing here at the Cactus, but could you give me any advice about how you got up off the ground or, you know, did you, you know, what was the process for getting this thing brought mm -hmm. back? I need some advice. And I mean, I don't know that he gave me two seconds worth of advice before he went into sales mode. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, you need to buy this the theater. You know, he said, I didn't have any idea you would be interested. You know, he knew I promoted a show or two here, but I was just trying to get my feet wet. And I don't guess he really thought of me as being a, a viable buyer or investor or whatever, uh, just that I had done promoted a couple of shows. And so he said, if I had any idea that you wanted to buy the theater, he said, you know, I I'm, I'm need to, you know, um, step back from it. He didn't say retire, step back from it. It needs someone else to carry it forward, something along those lines. And he said, you know, you live here, and instead of driving up and down the road to Plainview, you live here in Lubbock. You need to be the guy. So uh, he, like I say, he went into sales mode immediately. And so before long, there was no advice being doled out, it was uh, uh, <laughs> a sales pitch. <laughs> and so I put that off for uh, two years, about every six months. I mean, you almost mark it on your calendar. I'm sure he had it on his calendar, six months, called Daryl. And so he called me two or three times, and I think it's maybe the third call, maybe a year and a half or so into it, that I finally decided uh, it was very difficult getting that off the ground in plain view. I, uh, I won't take you into the whole story there, but we just couldn't get a lot of traction there. So I, then I started thinking, well, maybe this might be the right thing, and who knows, maybe it's a catalyst that we get something going here, then maybe it will spur that, mm -hmm. or I, maybe that will develop out of this, and then I have my own little circuit, you know, at least two, two stops booking a tour or something. Absolutely. To create my own routing. <laughs> so that's kind of how that came about. So are you actively running the theater in Plainview? Is it up and running? No, no. We did seven shows there in six months. Uh, City uh, Plainview gave me six months to uh, kind of take a trial run, mm -hmm. um, stage some shows, even though it was not presentable in terms of seating and or it had been stripped of everything kind of like this had been so i had to bring in temporary seating and tables and and just try to kind of create a a banquet type you know seated type uh, presentation and we did like say seven shows in six months so you know average one per month but uh I, I did that until we ran out of days and uh during that time we were trying to galvanize support from investors or corporate or uh you know, trying to create a board and, and solicit uh, grants and everything like that. But I just, it just never gelled. Couldn't yeah. get it to come together. So I had to kind of step away from that project. So like I say, a year and a half into the, the conversation with Don, it kind of came back around to, well, maybe this might be the best and maybe only path forward uh, for me to have fun, you know, Work in the theater angle, so well, that's kind of like you've been very successful here. Well, I, I, we've been successful uh, advancing it and and doing some integration of new programming and some. Uh, we got the seats, and you know, we had a lot of challenges along the way. But, Absolutely, but I, I'd say we've been very fortunate and had a lot of support. So let's talk about what you've done to the cactus. Cause I mean, you walk in here and the place looks almost brand new, but it's still got the touch and the old feel. Yeah. And so I know it's taken a lot of time and a lot of careful planning to make it look like this. Cause it looks, it looks still like it may be from the fifties. Right, you know? right. Well, that was the idea that I, uh, I love history. I love uh, the architecture, you know, I mean, think about it. Everything was, you know, you hate to say that things aren't good today, they're just not as good. In other words, we don't have the same music. We don't have the same cars, same movies. They're not making movie stars anymore in careers. Yeah. You know, it's it's flavor of the month and that's disposable. Right. But, you know, that's what I like to do is um, preserve and enhance and perpetuate and move forward uh, things that are good. And that's what I saw in the cactus is this historic building that uh, simply needed an injection of, uh, uh, you know, some upgrades. Sure. And so that's kind of how I set out. Uh, I tried to look at 
what was the most important thing? What did it need first? Uh, you know, is the sound more important or the seating? Uh, was it concession or the upgrades in the restroom or, you know, marquee out front, you know? And so you kind of just kind of start making this little checklist and go, well, the sound has got to be great. I think we can enhance the sound. And we put in the projection and the drop down screen so we'd have the ability to roll back the clock and do film, you know, cinema, in addition to the stage act. So, uh, you know, we kind of started there, uh, carpeting, uh, you know, enhancements to the stage, uh, just physical things that we could do to, to retain the history and the charm, but, you know, move it forward too and have a few modern creature comforts. So again, like, the, you know, the, the wider seats, the uh, cup holders, you know, things that, that people just expect in the 21st century. So uh, that's what we've tried to do and keep it as historical as we could. And, and, um, and also the programming. We've really, uh, that was my goal from the very beginning is to have more regional acts, more national and, and inter even international acts come in uh, and bring as wide a swath of, uh, of music and whatever it would be and, and add comedy and, you know, some special events and things like that. We do occasional fundraisers. And uh, I mean, we've got coming up this next week, we've got um, the Texas Tech Dance Club coming in to do their showcase. So we like to interact with uh, as many local, you know, organizations as we can. And, uh, you know, like I say, just as I describe it, have the pendulum just swing back and forth. Yeah. It's over here at country, and it swings over here to to rock and roll, and back over here and pick up some blues, and back over here to maybe a jazz element or a, a retro thing or, you know, whatever. Uh, we had Big Bad Voodoo Daddy just a few weeks ago, and, I mean, you talk about uh, a vibe and people just loving it because yeah. they felt like they were experiencing something nostalgic and yet modern and energetic and something that you'd have to go to a major city to see, you know, if we didn't book that. And that took six months, or six, six months, I wish, six years to get Big Bad Voodoo Daddy on that stage. It was a lot of phone calls, a lot of emails just to get the agent to get out of that pattern of just playing the major cities in yeah. Texas and actually come west of I-35. Um, so those are the challenges, you know, that's the... Uh, I look at those as kind of the fun part of the business is trying to figure out who could we get and what do we got to do to get them. Well, is that kind of your, the pleasure that this gives you is being able to present a show or present a, a screening of a yep. film or, you know, something that makes people feel good? I mean, yeah, is that the purpose for you? That It's, it's, a, it's a heart thing. Yeah. Yeah. So. I can tell you have a passion for it. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and by the diversity of the shows, I mean, not only do you have great music, and I will tell you, I've, I've attended several shows here since you've done the revamping, yeah. Yeah. and it's one of my favorite places to see a show because it's so intimate. Yeah. You can sit and actually hear the music. You know, you're, it's everything's up front and focused. Yep. It's comfortable. So you've done a great job. You've carried on the legacy of, uh -huh. of uh, the cactus very well. Well, good. Yeah, that's the goal is... Uh, we want people to come in and, and know that it's a listening room. You know, it's yeah. not a honky tonk. It's a, the, those places have their place. It's not a standing venue. It's a historic seated place where you can come in, sit down and, and hear a show just like you were going to see the symphony or, you know, anything on Broadway, you know, and uh, there's a certain decorum. Uh, and so some of the some of the younger shows that we bring in that maybe people have used to seeing a certain act, uh, you know, a honky tonk or a ballroom or dance hall or whatever. Uh, some of them, when they come in, they don't know exactly what to do or maybe how to act, you know. <laughs> so it's kind of, yeah, yeah, you're you really supposed to sit down or if, you know, it calls for it and the audience is standing, that's cool, you know, but, but, uh, it's not about talking and, right. and hollering across the room. It's, uh, it's an experience. So well, and as an artist do. and a singer, songwriter and musician, we appreciate that. Yeah. So it's, it's a very unique place to see a show here in Lubbock. Yeah. That's, Absolutely. that's the idea. We want it to, to be historic and yet at the same time, uh, right here in the 21st century and presenting new acts and nostalgic acts and classic, you know, whatever term you want to put on it and just the widest variety that we can bring and, uh, you know, try to really rotate things around so people can come more often. I, I put a real emphasis on uh, pricing things 
as economically as we can. I try to treat the patrons like I'd want to be treated, not sure. how much can we right. make from them and what fees can we add and, and all these kinds of things. I'm very, very focused on a good value and a good environment. And, you know, I just I love seeing people come back on a regular basis. And we have so many faithful customers and people that, I mean, just about any time you open the door, you can count on these certain folks are going to be here because they, this is their place. Probably got their specific seat where they oh, want yeah. to sit. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. If they can't get that particular seat, you're going to hear about it. Well, <laughs> you know, they know, I mean, when the seats go on sale, they got to be looking and we, we try to keep them up to date through our social media and, and our e-blasts and and uh, maybe an early announcement from the stage. If somebody's coming, it's going on sale next week. I was like, hey, just so you all know, you know, we got, you know, a big act coming next week. It'll go on sale Tuesday morning. So, and uh, so we have a lot of fun with that. And there's a lot of people that, you know, anxiously anticipate what are we going to bring next? Or uh, I wonder if they can get this act. And and occasionally somebody will come by and say, hey, have you thought about so and so? Yeah. Hey, you know, my brother-in-law and this and that. And, and I know this, you know, connection and they're always wanting to help. And sure. and I've taken a lot of those ideas and I try to make it happen if I can, if I, if I feel like it'll work. Um, but yeah, this is a real... Uh, it's very risk intensive. <laughs> Absolutely. So what is your vision moving forward the next 10 years for the cactus? Kind of what do you see the cactus growing into? Well, I, uh, I hope that we just continue to make an impression on the uh, traveling touring acts that are out there, on the booking agents that you have to have that relationship with. Uh, you know, I've had to really prove to a lot of them that, hey, yeah, we're maybe an intimate, you know, smaller space than the Act is used to playing, but it's an experience that they'll appreciate. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, just like Big Bad Voodoo Daddy, I mean, those guys can sell 1,500 tickets in some markets. Well, we have 383 seats. How do I convince them that it makes sense to come play this small room? Well, because it is historic, because it is a uh, chance for them to come to the hometown of a rock legend. You know, Buddy Holly is probably an influence to a lot of those guys growing up. And so we, uh, you know, we have to play all those cards, you know, uh, to get some of these acts to come in here. And sometimes we, we have to have a higher ticket price than people are used to paying. Sure. But it's always <clears throat> reasonable. If you think about it, the act and the cost of the seat versus how many we have. And you're lucky to be in that little group of 383 people on that given night. It all makes sense. Well, especially if you think about being here at a little higher ticket price versus traveling to AT&T Stadium, paying two or $300 a ticket, oh, probably more for oh, some acts. Oh, you know, yeah. Oh, yeah. And There's being able to that. just drive 15 minutes across town and catch some of the best music right. in Texas, for sure. Right. You've yeah. had some great guests. Well, we've really been fortunate. We, I mean, we have big names going here. I mean, whether it's Diamond Rio, uh, Christopher Cross, uh, Don McLean. I mean, I could just rattle off, you know, all kinds of names that are household names mm -hmm. that people know. And, uh, you know, at first glance, people think, is that really at the Cactus or is that a tribute show? We, we get that a lot because we do have a lot of touring mm -hmm. tributes and, and local tributes <clears throat> as well. And people will call up now, is this the real Oak Ridge Boys? <laughs> is this the real Crystal Gale? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Is this and, the real Jimmy Dale Gilmore? <laughs> right. And so it's like, uh, yes, naturally, of course. But so that's kind of a funny thing sometimes. But I, I understand why some people would ask that because sometimes it's not quite believable that we could get a, a big name act sure. in an intimate space like this. But a lot of the, uh, you know, let's just say veteran acts, you know, they've enjoyed, you know, playing to big, big audiences and stuff and, and all that time in the limelight. And, and a lot of them like to scale down and be heard. They want to be, they want to have a, a captive audience that's there to hear mm -hmm. and hang on every word, you know, so... Uh, that's what it's about for me is trying to see what we can get in here. Absolutely. Well, I don't want to put you on the spot. I know it's hard to pick favorites, but out of <laughs> all the shows that you've produced here and promoted and everything that you've had, oh. is there one that really stands out as something that was really special to you? Oh, man. There's so many. There's so many. I mean, there's there's really maybe, you know, five or ten that really jump out. Uh, gosh. Uh, 
I mean, the Big Bad Voodoo Daddy, you know, stands out because it was such an effort to get them here, and they delivered on every, uh, it fired on all cylinders, and the people filing out of here, I think I've gotten the most response out of that show uh, as any show we've ever had. You know, please bring them I can't believe, i just been wanting to see them uh, all my life, or, you know, I saw them in the Super Bowl halftime 20 years ago. I never thought I'd get to see them live, you know, that type of deal. So that stands out. Um, you know, uh, Crystal Gale, uh, so personable and such a legend. Uh, people love her. Uh, uh, Christopher Cross, uh, the Don McLean show, um, mentioned some of those. But, you know, they're just, um, they're all special. And just some of them are a little more special. Absolutely. <laughs> so tell the viewers and listeners mm -hmm. where we can find uh, your social media links, where we can find uh, calendar yeah. for the shows and where we can buy tickets. Yeah. Pretty simple. We have just like most folks these days, uh, we have we have a link tree, you know, and, and uh, so, you know, we have Facebook presence, uh, Instagram, our uh, e-blast uh, you can sign up for at the theater. You know, there's a clipboard in the lobby. You can call in. You can sign up for it online. Our website, of course, Cactus Theater. T E R on theater.com. Um, get on the mailing list, uh, social media. Uh, we have a lot of radio ads, magazine ads. We try to be very interactive in the community and and uh, participate, you know, in a lot of different things and and getting to visit about shows coming up. And but yeah, just your normal, you know, Facebook and social media channels is number one, I guess, these days. And uh, we just appreciate everybody you know, looking us up and taking the time to come experience a show in, uh, in an intimate setting in a historic room. And, uh, and hopefully they'll walk away thinking, wow, that, that really was special. That's the idea. Perfect. Well, thank you again. Yeah. yeah. Appreciate your time today. You bet. Enjoyed it so much. Me too. Me you too. guys can watch all these episodes on the City of Lubbock's YouTube channel. You can also find them on the City of Lubbock's TV channel, My LBK Connect. And the audio is available anywhere that podcast streaming is available. So please check out all the archived episodes. And uh, season two is, is going to be a great one. So stay tuned for more. Daryl, thanks again. Yeah, thanks for and, having uh, me. <laughs> you guys come out and check out the cactus. There's some amazing shows coming up. Thank you.